hello, hello. Welcome back to the Bundred Report. I'm Chris. I'm Charlie. Today we are doing an interview. It's been a while since we've done an interview, hasn't it? I know. I hope we're going to do okay because I feel like I need to get back into the interview mode. <laughs> Just been asked like rabbiting on about nonsense. So um, we have to, yeah, we've got a very special guest joining us today. Um, I'm super excited to talk to him. So he's the first uh, of the players we're going to be interviewing for the 100. So he is super excited to join this specific team. He's had a lot of franchise experience. He's a white ball specialist, played for England before, and he's also a member of the TMS team now as well. Yeah, I can't wait. Um, but before we do, uh, if you guys are joining us and you haven't subscribed to us yet, please do. We are on Instagram as well, at The 100 Report, on Twitter, at 100 Report. And if you're watching this on YouTube, the button to click like is right there and do give us a follow. We are fun, I promise with you. But uh, without further ado, let's get into our interview with the one and only Tim R. Mills. Tim R. Mills, thank you so much for joining us on The 100 Report. How are you? How was your Easter weekend? Yeah, good, thank you. Nice and quiet. Just caught up with a little bit of family and then we were back in training on, on Monday anyway, so we um, bank holidays, weekends, you know, it doesn't really matter in, in professional sport, you, you, you crack on as, as you need to. But um, yeah, it was, it was nice, thank you. The weather was pretty good down south, so can't complain. Yeah, it, it's strange. Obviously, I am by no means any good at cricket whatsoever, but I went for my first net yesterday and this morning I couldn't get out of bed. So um, <laughs> I'm sure you guys are a little bit more prepared for things like that. <laughs> um, but... One of the things that I wanted to ask, um, given that you obviously have been playing cricket for uh, quite, a, quite a time now, thinking back, when was it the first time that you realised that you could bowl at the speed of sound? <laughs> oh, I, don't know. I don't know if I'm that quick, but um, it, it was apparent uh, quite early. I, I was a late comer to cricket. I, never, I played my first ever game of cricket when I was 14, so I didn't grow up with the sport. I, didn't, I wasn't in you know, youth setups. It wasn't playing in the back garden with brothers, sisters, mum, dad or anything. Um, but when I eventually started to play, it was kind of the one. It was it was noticeable at that village standard that I was, you know, quicker than anybody else playing. And then that was pretty much the case as I, as my rise kind of went really kind of go from a village team. I then kind of joined a, a bigger, more established uh, cricket club. Then I was playing. I was grew up in Suffolk, so minor counties um, age group stuff. The minor counties first team, then on to Essex Academy as well. Um, so from there, and it, so I've, I've always been blessed with with pace, I guess. And then it's just been a, a case of um, trying to harness around it, and and obviously uh, working a bit of accuracy and a bit of skill as well as as, as I went on. It's obviously a, a great bonus as well being a lefty as well. It feels like as soon as anybody sees a left hander, they go right. You're either we're either going to make you as fast as we possibly can, or we're going to start uh, teaching you a ball finger spin. Um, was that yeah. ever, was that ever a thing in your mind? Did you go? Maybe, let's let's see if I can turn it away. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, I was always about fast bowling. But yeah, you're right. Being a lefty is it's a natural advantage. You know, you grow up. Chances are, you're playing cricket in the garden or or, or, or a local club, playing youth cricket. More often than not, you're facing right arm over bowlers, aren't you? If if um, mum, dad, uncle, cousin, or anything, you're playing in the garden, giving you some throwdowns. It's normally right arm over, bowling machine set up, right arm over. So left armers do have a bit of an advantage, I think, just going back from, you know, really small kids or whatever time you start playing cricket, just uh, you're, you're something that, um, that a lot of batters haven't faced as much of, I guess. And I'd love to ask you about franchise cricket, because obviously you've got a lot of experience with different franchise teams around the world. From a player's perspective, how does it work when you join a new team? Obviously you have about, you know, four or five days as such to sort of build that team spirit. What's the, the process that you guys go through as a new team? Oh, look, it varies team to team and, and ultimately the most successful teams get that, you know, that process um, right and or as, as, as right as they can. As you say, the, the lead time into tournaments varies. Sometimes you'll, you might have two weeks, sometimes you might have two days. Um, people flying in at different times, depending on what com uh, commitments they have uh, pre, pre whatever tournament you're playing in. So. Yeah, as I said, it does vary, but you'll fly into whatever country you, you, you fly into. You get to the hotel, you normally have a night, just a day kind of just to get yourself into the hotel, get, get the flight out of, your, out of your body, wherever you're flying in from. Um, you'll go and pick up your kit from a, from a team room and then you'll meet whoever you, your teammates are going to be. You'll have, you'll have a training session. Um, the, the more you play, like I, 
it would be very rare for me now to go to a new team and not know the majority of, of people in my team, um, either from playing with or against them. As you say, I've played a lot of franchise cricket now over the last four years or so. So um, more often than not now, guys know each other. But when you're, when you're new to it, it's, it can be a bit daunting, especially if you've got some big names in, in your team, guys you haven't met before. Um, but then also, also there's, a, there's a cultural thing as well. So if you're going to Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, you're playing with majority, obviously, uh, foreign guys to you. So there's different cultures. Uh, for example, when playing in the PSL, you have to take into account uh, prayer times. Obviously, a lot of the guys will be praying five times a day. So uh, there'll be guys just popping off from training to, to, to pray or to... Or if you know, on so Friday prayer is obviously a really big one in, in, in Islam. So if you have training on a Friday afternoon, you, as a foreigner, you need to know that that training is going to take longer because at some point they're all going to go and do their, you know, their big, big weekly prayer, uh, prayer for the week. Um, so these are the things that you learn that you don't necessarily think of when you think about franchise cricket. Um, but yeah, the, the better you can get involved and understand and, and get amongst the uh, Again, amongst the, the, your, your new teammates for what is a, a short period of time, the better, in my opinion. I was always curious as well, especially playing in big global franchise uh, competitions, and especially, like you say, if you're going somewhere like the subcontinent or uh, to uh, somewhere like that, or maybe even South Africa to a degree, um, how much uh, uh, language barriers can be an issue? Obviously, you might have some people for whom English is not their first or indeed their second language. Um, do you find that that makes it sometimes a little bit more difficult in terms of especially on field tactics and trying to discuss play or does it not become an issue after a while yeah for, for the most part it's okay because you'll often have uh local senior players that have played international cricket uh you know have, have been around the game a lot who will speak good english so at the very least there will be normally the captain of your team in as you say in the subcontinent will be a, a senior figure more often than not, he's played for his country, so he'll you know he'll speak good English, and he can then help with with those language barriers. Um, when I played in the Afghanistan Premier League a couple of years ago, that was probably the one where it was a little bit more tricky. Uh, you know, the captain he didn't speak great English himself. Uh, we had a foreign coach, and it, it was very difficult to you kind of lean on the the English speakers that are there to try and help get messages out there. But once you're in the middle, it's it's more of a case of just pointing and. And, and, and gesturing as opposed to, to needing to, to speak, you know, any, uh, you know, like my Pashtu or my Urdu isn't, isn't, isn't exactly fluent. So I, I don't, I don't try that. <laughs> yeah. It's probably in terms of shouting across fields, it's probably similar when you're facing gale force winds in April in England. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, but I, speaking of franchising uh, games, uh, we wanted to move on to the hundred because obviously it's, it's the hundred report. Um, what were your first thoughts when you first heard about the 100? Uh, especially because it's such a different format and it's such a different way of playing the game. Um, just wanted to get your thoughts on the game as a concept in general. Yeah, obviously, look, it, was, obviously it was a little while ago now, wasn't it? When, it, when the, um, the announcement was first made, obviously we've, we've lost, we should be one season deep now. Um, but for obvious reasons, we're not. But as a, as a concept, I still don't, I don't really know. Uh, I wasn't, they, they, they had a, uh, well, I think about four or five trial games at the end of one summer, but um, that was the year that we at Sussex got to finals day, so it, it clashed, so we weren't available to, to play in these trial games. Um, or by all accounts, the, the trial games went pretty well. The guys said it was pretty easy to, to pick up. It didn't take too long before you um, you knew what you were doing. But yeah, I haven't actually thought about the concept too much. I think it'll be, I'd like to think we'll pick it up quickly. I don't think it'll be too dissimilar from T20 cricket um, in terms of the actual gameplay when you're out there in the middle. Uh, obviously, I could be I could be wrong, but um, I think that'll be that'll be one of the main things that whenever we do get together as a squad uh, after the blast and before the hundred, you want to just make sure everybody knows the rules exactly, and and then try and figure out who's going to potentially be doing what roles. Um, and it, it, again, I think it'll be one of those where the team that adapts the quickest and finds the the winning formula the quickest will will probably win because it's as you say every team's going to be starting on a on an even keel i think you've probably hit the nail quite uh, quite well on the head there we were discussing because one of the things we've been doing is is just sort of looking through the teams and going uh, through as a sort of team talk and analyzing what roles people play within the game and um, it seems like they're is people have taken a different approach in almost every single team. And um, I know that 
uh, Charlie's actually quite a big fan of the Southern Brave based on uh, the selection of their bowlers, um, of, which, of which you are one of. <laughs> um, but speaking as a bowler, do you feel that there's going to be an added pressure? And it's already tough enough in T20 when bowlers are routinely having to face the likes of people like Rishabh Pant or, or Ben Stokes, who are going to smash you all over the place. Um, so not only that pressure, but given that it's even shorter, um, do you feel that there's an added pressure? Or especially given the five balls, ten balls per side thing, it might actually work the other way and make it a little bit easier? Uh, look, it's, the, the, the only pressure will be what you put upon yourself. Um, I'm, I'm of the opinion that it will... You know the cream will rise to the top, and the people that maybe aren't quite to the to the level will, will fall away to the to the side. That's that's how I see it. That's um, it's an opportunity to to test yourself against the best in the world. You look at the names as you say in the in the team sheets. There's some some serious players there. So if you can stand up against those, you're you're only going to do yourself a, a massive credit. And if you don't, you're going to learn about yourself where you, where you need to get better. Um, so it's it's going to be more so how guys deal with that pressure. Obviously, there'll be a lot of guys that play in this tournament this summer that won't have played in franchise cricket before. Um, so they'll be, they they might feel a bit more pressure, a bit more nerves, as you say, playing on 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 the big stage against these you know, world class players. But for kind of maybe those of us that have played franchise cricket before, I, it'll just be another another tournament really. And you just you go about your business as you do, and you expect yourself to perform, and you'll judge yourself on your performances. That's certainly how I'll, I'll be going about it. Um, if anything, having played T10 cricket for a bowler, the expectations are, are, are less because you're in T10 cricket, you're expected to go for runs and it's more, the batsmen are more under pressure to the score runs. Yeah. Whereas uh, in T20 cricket, it's more, a little bit more even. So I think, you know, uh, the hundred could potentially be somewhere in the middle of that. But again, until we actually start playing until we get maybe two or three games in, we won't quite know, uh, what's 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 the best tactic uh, available for, for for the tournament itself? It's going to be a lot of learning on the fly. And without showing my allegiances too much, I am very excited about the Southern Brave team, um, especially considering you know the formidable bowling attack uh, lineup that we have, and that mostly consists of the Sussex players. Um, what were your thoughts when you saw the team? Obviously, it's rejigged a little bit. There weren't too many changes with this year's draft. But what are your thoughts on the Southern Braves team? Yeah, look, I think they did a great job. Obviously, that that original auction seems so so long ago now. Was it eighteen months or so? Um, but the fact that we kept pretty much the same squad, we I think us and I can't remember which other team were were kind of the only two teams that that barely made any changes from the original list. Um, kind of bears testament to to how well Giles White, Mahela, um, you know, those guys did in in building our squad. Um, whereas some teams obviously used it as a chance to to kind of rejig and, and shake it up. So. Yeah, look, I, I think we've got a great squad. As you say, I know a lot of the boys from Sussex. We've we've they've chosen to keep us together as best as they can. Um, but yeah, we've we've got a good team. You look at the team where we've got a lot of bases covered. We've got a lot of all rounders. Uh, obviously, we've got specialists at kind of all different positions. So, uh, look, I'm sure every team will be looking at their team and thinking they're great and that they're going to win. But um, yeah, obviously, that's 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 my standpoint as well. And on anything that Mahela touches at the moment seems to turn to gold. I mean, his IPL experience will be so beneficial for the Southern Brave, I'm sure. Um, but also, yeah, I wanted to ask you what, what you th think your role is within the team. Obviously, it is a heavy pace attack already. Are you hoping to open? Or are you hoping to sort of do more of the death bowling overs? Where do you see yourself in the team? Yeah, look, I, I, tradition, traditionally I'll, I'll bowl in that initial power play and then I'll come back and bowl at the death. So those are the two hardest times to bowl. And that's, you know, that's where I've made my kind of my living and my career. So I'll, I'll, I'd like to think that's the role I've been drafted to continue to do. Um, but you have to be adaptable as well. If I get asked to do a different role, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. As you say, we've got a lot of bowling options in this team, both uh, in terms of pace and with spin. So uh, as you say, uh, until really we get closer to the time and you start speaking to the coaches and to the support staff, you don't quite know what your role is going to be. You know, we might rock up for training day one and, and Mahela might give me, say, oh, we want to do a different, we want you to do a different role on the team. And, you know, you can't really say no. So you have to um, adapt as best as you can and, and, and give, you know, your best performance, even if it's not in a role that you prefer doing. But, um, yeah, I'd, I'd imagine that would be my role in the team. But as I say, we're... What, four, four months away, five months away, whatever it is, and, and we'll find out in July, I guess. <laughs> I 
did look at the Southern Braves as well, especially given the bowling unit that's there and the the level of experience in white ball cricket. Do you feel like, especially from a personal standpoint and also from the team's perspective as well, that you're going to see um, huge benefits having a bowling attack that have a dearth of experience in international white ball cricket? Yeah, experience is always key. As, you, as, as I mentioned earlier, maybe there's going to be some guys that haven't played franchise cricket, haven't played these big tournaments, and it might take them a couple of games to kind of, you know, settle down, get their, get their feet under the table as such. But whereas you look at our squad, most guys have, a lot of guys have played international cricket and also played in franchise tournaments around the world. We don't have too many players that, that haven't experienced, you know, these, these different conditions, these different atmospheres. Um, so I think that will be a definite plus and a benefit. Um, and, you know, we've got an experienced side and, and, and a, a team that will expect to do well, I'm sure. So I think, again, the, the main key is just going to be adapting to the, to the format and to the tactics as, as best we can and figuring out a winning formula as soon as we can. Um, and obviously, ultimately, it comes down to individual performances. Can, some, can somebody score 100? Can somebody take a five foot? Because if, if somebody does that in a game, you win more often than not. So when it comes down to it, that's, that's where I see it, see it going. And again, with the squad assembled, I'd like to think that we've got uh, quite a lot of players that are able to, to potentially do that. And more recently, we've actually heard you um, regularly on TMS especially over the India series, has it been, is it difficult as a player to sort of go from observing to being observed and sort of being paid for your opinion one day and then kind of blocking it out the next when you're back to being a player? How does that work? Uh, not, not really when I'm playing. I don't obviously think about it at all. I, I'm just trying to be as kind of pragmatic with my time as possible. Obviously, playing only T20 cricket, short form cricket, I have, I have a lot more free time than, than your you know, um, regular cricketer who's um, playing all formats. You know, in, in terms of days of the year, I, I, I do less in, in the year. So how do I fill that time? And you know, I have an interest in the media and journalism. So if, um, if I can get work doing so, I will. Uh, I have to be careful a little bit about what I say because I'm still a current player and I have you know, I have skin in the game. I have relationships with players, coaches and things. So I try not to be, you know, too harsh or too um, too opinionated at the moment. Maybe that'll change when I retire because um, you don't want to be, you know, saying things that are maybe out of line or, or very opinionated about a certain player and then you're playing with them, um, you know, a few weeks later. That's obviously not a... Not, not something that you'd recommend doing. But um, yeah, look, I enjoy doing the media work. I, I try and give as, as good an insight I can into the current world of, of playing. And I think I might actually be doing some stuff with the BBC during the 100 as well. So I'll be playing, I'll actually be playing and working, I think, in, in the same capacity. So when, um, when I'm not playing, you might also see me doing some commentary also. And I'll try and, if I can, give as, as best insight as I can into what it's actually like to, to play in the games. Yeah, I, I speak from a, a fan's perspective that I always found that so interesting. You know, you think back in the days of, uh, I think it was the Big Bash League where Andrew Flintoff got mic'd up and it's just that ever let, the, or that extra level of involvement from uh, a, an audience or a spectator's point of view that really just draws it into it. I certainly get the feeling that, that the 100 is very much about audience inclusion. Um, but... Um, yeah, that, <laughs> I actually had to ask because I've been a big fan of, uh, of TMS for ages and it's a very silly question, but I feel like I, I'm duty bound to ask it. What is the best cake that you've been sent? <laughs> well, I think if I'm being completely honest, I don't actually think I've ever had a cake because that seems to be more on the test matches, doesn't it? Where they, you know, obviously they're there for four days, they're there all day. And as you said, they've got a, a band of loyal kind of listeners that, that send in all these, these spectacular cakes, whereas I've mainly worked on the, on the ODIs and the T20s. So uh, I don't, off the top of my head, I, I haven't had one of these famous TMS cakes, but um, yeah, maybe, maybe in the future I'll, I'll, I'll be so lucky. Obviously with COVID now, everything's a bit difficult. You can't just be sending, you know, items of food or anything to, to commentary boxes. Well, maybe someone maybe we'll will be so kind to send you, send you a cake during your um, 100 reporting. Do you have any special requests? <laughs> no, I'm not fussy. I'll take I'll take whatever's whatever's available. <laughs> well, Tim, well, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for joining us on the Hundred Report, and we're really looking forward to seeing you in action this summer with the Southern Brave. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, cheers, guys. Take care. All the best. Well, he was lovely to talk to, wasn't he? You can totally tell that he's got um, experience in sports journalism at the moment because he answers questions so well. Yeah, it's. It's so telling, isn't it? He's clearly very, very media savvy, but also very 
informative. I feel like we got literally everything um, out of an answer from him. Um, yeah, really, really interesting to talk to and very exciting to actually start getting the view of what the 100 is in terms of the players and the way that they're viewing it themselves. Um, yeah, uh, it's, yeah, it's very exciting. But um, let's do one more plug, shall we? So if you guys enjoyed that and you like what we do, please give us a subscribe and a like and a comment on the things down there. Also, we are on Twitter at 100report, the word 100report, and also on Instagram at the100report. But thanks again for following us. And, and do stay tuned because we are still releasing all our team talks. Uh, we've got a few more to go. So if you want to be the first to know the latest on what's going on with the 100 before this summer arrives, stick around. Thanks for joining us. Stay tuned for some more interviews coming up too. <laughs>